Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on the subject of loads on structures. Loads is just another terminology for forces uh, or pressures or line distributed forces or volume distributed forces. Um, this is from chapter two. We're in section two of chapter two where we're talking about classification of loads and we're in subsection one where we're talking about general de definitions and load combinations. There are two basic design methods that we used. One is called allowed strength design and the other is called load and resistance factor design. Uh, the difference of the two has to do with how we account for some sort of safety factor. Um, we would never want to design a building where when we reach the design loads the building collapses. We would always like to have some excess capacity to account for a host of uncertainties, like we don't necessarily know the exact stress capacity of the material or uh, members that should be aligned on each other's centroid aren't exactly aligned, columns aren't exactly straight, and so forth. Um, so to account for all manner of uncertainty, we incorporate a safety factor. In the allowed strength design, we understand what the predicted stress capacity of all the materials is and we design the, the members so that the stress falls substantially short of that. So for example, we might design a structure so that under full loads its stress only goes to 60% of what we think would fail the material. And so we have that 40% left over or if you think of it another way, that 40% over the 60% provides us with a two-thirds safety factor, or in other words, a, a safety factor of 1.67. That would be allowed strength design, and up until about 30 years ago, that was the only design method that we had. At some point, a new method called the load and resistance factor design method was generated. And in that method, account is taken of the fact that we have far greater uncertainty in certain kinds of loads than others. For example, live loads or wind loads are less predictable or less certain than say, the dead weight of the structure itself. So the load and resistance factor design method has taken over a large part of the design field, but both of these systems continue to compete with each other. And in the steel industry, uh, there seems to be a preference for the LRFD method in academia and among the design professionals that are generating building designs. But in the fabricational field, the allowed stress design is preferred. In the current steel manual, they're both presented side by side. So every time you open a page of the steel manual, you have the allowed stress design on one side and the LRFD on the other. In this course, we're going to focus on the load and resistance factor design method, um, but uh, we understand that this alternative method is sometimes preferred and is equally valid from, um, from a legal point of view and in terms of codes. So when you design a building, you will have to decide which of these methods you will use, and you're required to use that method consistently all the way through, and it will be specified on the first page of the structural drawings, what code you're working out of, and which design method that you're using. Some of the things we're gonna talk about will actually be allowed strength design. In other words, we're generally going to focus on LRFD, but certain manufacturers of certain products present all their tables in terms of allowed strength design. So in presenting these videos, we're going to try and make really sure that we uh, inform you upfront every time we start talking about a particular sizing operation or design operation, which of these methods that we're using. In the LRFD method, we have load combinations. So for example, if D stands for the dead load of the elements in the building, and L stands for the live load on floors, 
and LR stands for the live load on roofs, then one of the prime load combinations that we have to design to is this one. The very first one here is 1.2 times the dead load plus 1.6 times the live load plus 1.6 times the roof live load. So what this is saying is we're throwing in a 20% safety factor based on uncertainty in the dead load and a 60% uh, additional capacity associated with the live load. So in other words, whatever we say are the design live load and the design dead load, we're going to multiply them by this factor, which is where the term uh, load factor design comes from. So you'll notice there is a load and resistance factor design. We haven't gotten to the resistance factor issue yet, but we are talking about load. And we're saying that to account for loads, we're going to have a design dead load and we know how to calculate that. We're going to have a design live load, which is specified in the code, a design roof live load, and we're going to multiply by these factors. And then we're going to say under the combination of those, we should not exceed the stress capacity of the material that's supposed to be holding this building up. Um, if we can cut it really close, we can say that the stress capacity will reach the, the stress will reach the yield stress limit right when we take this full load combination. But under no circumstances should the stress under this full load combination exceed the stress capacity of the material. So if we truly understand the material and our computational methods are accurate, then we will reach the point where we're approaching the yield stress or we're at the yield stress but never exceed the yield stress under this combined set of forces. This is in contrast to the so-called allowed strength design, where instead of having separate factors for each of these loads, we're just saying under the full load combination of dead plus live plus live on the roof, the stress within the material should never exceed some fraction of the yield stress, such as 0.6 times the yield stress. Okay, so that's one load combination. Another one is 1.2 times dead plus 1.6 times wind. And then we take 1.0 times live plus 1.0 times live on the roof. So we've thrown in this big fat safety factor on wind because in this case, we're focusing on the negative effects of wind but we're saying we don't want to assume that we don't have a fairly substantial live load. On the other hand, it would be extraordinarily rare that a building would have the full live load at the time of a hurricane when we have the full wind load. So the code says rather than put a big fat safety factor of 1.6 on live, we put the 1.6 on the wind and now we're going to just take the full live for the floors and the full live for the roof. Another interesting one is this third one where we take 0.9 times the dead plus 1.6 times wind. This load combination deals with the issue of the fact that wind can actually pick a building up and move it or roll it over or lift up one side of it off its foundations. So we're going to account for the full wind load. And then we understand that the building represents the ballast that keeps the building in place or the dead load of the building is the ballast that keeps the building in place. And to be conservative, we're actually lowering our estimated dead load to incorporate a safety factor associated with the uncertainty in that. And so the agreed upon combination is we're assuming that the ballast associated with the dead weight of the building is only 90% of whatever we calculate it to be. So we have some safety factor on that. And then we have a safety factor on the wind load of 1.6. These are three load combinations out of something on the order of 15 or 20, which are listed in the code. And these are based on publications that come out jointly from the American Society of Civil Engineers and the Structural Engineering Institute of the United States. 
And um, those things get incorporated directly into the codes. We are not going to complicate our lives with 15 or 20 load combinations. It turns out that for 98% of the structures you'll design, you've solved the overwhelming majority of the problems from a structural point of view if you've designed for these three load combinations. They're pretty simple, they're pretty straightforward, and they're the ones that we're going to emphasize throughout this design process. In trying to understand structural loads, we tend to divide these things up into categories. Um, and we do this with every subject matter we deal with and structures and loads on structures is not an exception to that case. So this diagram represents one of the ways that we divide up the world. Um, we have fixed elements, which we call the static or the dead loads on the structure. That's anything that will never be taken away over the lifetime of the structure. So it involves columns and beams and trusses and also floor decking generally, um, which would include concrete and steel corrugated decking working in composite action or concrete slab floors or whatever it is that we happen to incorporate into the building. Anything that we can reasonably presume will be there for the lifetime of the building we call dead loads and those are taken as static permanent loads. Um, on the scale of things you'll notice here we have on one side we have static, on the other side we have dynamic, and for the case of fixed elements they occur at the static end of the scale because presumably they are there forever. We also have occupancy loads or live loads, equipment loads which sometimes are referred to as a form of live load, it all depends. For example, if you have a parking level in your building, you have vehicles rolling around on it, those would be considered equipment loads that move, so they are a form of live load. So we're making a distinction between the human live load and equipment load, which might be live or might be not. Uh, for example, under equipment, we might have permanent HVAC equipment, or at least fairly permanent, on one end, or we might have automotive traffic on one of these parking levels, which would be potentially uh, short-term loads of, of one type or another. Uh, we have wind loads, seismic or earthquake loads, snow loads. Um, we have loads that involve things like foundation settlement. For example, certain types of buildings, if the foundations settle, it will introduce stresses into the building, which are very disturbing kinds of stresses. In some instances, foundation settlement can destroy a building. We also have something called residual stresses and thermal stresses, and we'll get into all of that uh, when we get to each of those topics. But let's take occupancy loads as an example. Um, these are uh, loads that certainly are not long-term, they're not permanent, so they exist towards the dynamic end of the scale here. Um, they can be shifting in time. For example, people come to work in the morning, they go home at night, and on a daily basis uh, there's a constant change in the live load on floors. And they also go out to lunch and they shift around the building and we need to be able to account for every possible reasonable pattern of variation over time and space in accounting for occupancy loads. Occupancy loads can also be oscillating in nature, and the classic one would be um, people doing the bunny hop, or excuse me, people in um, a stadium who sway from side to side can induce oscillating motion in that structure. So whoever designs a stadium has to understand what likely frequencies people might be moving back and forth in unison and properly account for that. Any space where people might be dancing in some oscillatory manner that has to be accounted for. This can go all the way to the impact end of the scale uh, where people are doing the bunny hop 
the classic example that I cite of this is that there was once damage done to the Civic Center in Charlotte, North Carolina when the uh, Mary Kay Cosmetics folks were deciding that they wanted to do the bunny hop in huge numbers. Fortunately, it didn't bring the building down, but it caused the floor they were on to shake so badly that ceiling tiles and fluorescent fixtures at the level below began to fall out of the ceiling. So human loads can be anywhere from gently shifting in time and space to oscillating sympathetically with the structure to impact. Uh, in the case of equipment loads, we have an even more extreme case where we might have permanently bolted in place equipment. We might have equipment that's being moved around. We might have equipment that's rotating in some way. And if there's an off balance uh, load in that structure, it can pr produce oscillations that might sympathetically interact with the building structure and cause the building structure to start to vibrate wildly, or they can be impact loads. For example, an automobile uh, on one of the lower floors of a building where parking has been provided. Uh, if we have somebody who revs up their engine and goes screaming down the, the ramp and runs into a column, that constitutes an enormous impact load and the columns need to be designed to handle that. So let's talk about impact loads for a moment just to give you a sense of scale or what this means. This particular little uh, demonstration involves a board on top, a board on the bottom, and these hinges. And there's a single nail which has been driven into a hole here. Um, and this person who weighs a little over 200 pounds is standing with his weight centered right over the top of that nail. So that nail has a full 200 pounds of force on it, or a bit more, and it is not penetrating any further into the wood. So we have to say that you can't drive that nail with a, two, a steady 200 pound force. On the other hand, we can take a classic 16 ounce hammer, which is a one pound hammer. It's the most common weight of hammer that we make. And we can take that hammer and we can slam it down on that nail. And if the person wielding the hammer is strong enough, that nail can be driven all the way through the board in a single blow. So what that's saying is that the force that's being exerted as an impact force by this one pound hammerhead is well over 200 pounds. It might be 500 or it might be 1,000 pounds. It lasts for an extremely brief period, but has a huge impact in terms of driving this nail in. So the point of this is impact loads can be extremely deleterious to your structure and anywhere that you're likely to have impact loads like speeding vehicles that might take out a column from the building uh, you need to account for that in the design of the building so that ends our discussion we're uh, on classifications of loads and we've been talking about general definitions and load combinations